Hello and welcome to my second annual year-end reading wrap-up. 2022 was quite the eventful year for me behind the scenes, but I did manage to read quite a bit as well as to do this wrap-up as well. Let's take a look at what I've marked as complete on Goodreads. Shall I, as of me doing this video, I've read 71 books, which is five more than last year. I'm also now taking bets on how many that I had completely forgotten about. Starting the year off with something spicy, and I read Look But Don't Touch by Cory D. It was a sort of a series of short stories revolving around a DDLG. And if you don't know what that is, count your blessings. I remember trying to get into the other stories in the series, but I wasn't feeling it despite me having marked the first book as four stars. Not my thing, but you do you. Up next is something else pretty spicy with Sheriff's Gay Revenge by Jen Harker. I don't have much to say about it since GR only listed it as being 13 pages, but for sure you need to check that you're into that sort of thing before reading it, but you know what? I don't care. And I was apparently on a spicy bender in January because I also read Taming the Beast by Evangeline Anderson. Kind of a weird spicy play on Beauty and the Beast where there's only one way to break the curse and it sugars in with Gisela's kindness and compassion. If you know what I mean. Up next is Tamaria Morgan by Cinnamon Worth. I sure hope that's a pen name. I have zero memory of this, which isn't surprising given that I rated it two stars. Not even reading the summary nor my review was enough to spark anything. Thank you, next. I then read Dune upon my husband's urging and the release of the movie. I wouldn't recommend that book to anybody. Satan would take one look at that and say, no, thank you. It was nothing but page after page describing stuff that literally didn't matter. People sat around and inhaled cinnamon all day long. Despite me doing it for a Patreon, it was so bad that I decided to not even read the second book. Not finishing a terrible series is self-care. Then I read Rescuing Emily by Susan Stroker. In it, a single mom ends up renting a guest house from a Delta Force soldier. She ends up being approached by some scumbag guy who tricks her into believing that her new landlord is holding certain threats over her head and believes him and gives him literally all of her money. When the ruse is uncovered, the man kidnaps her daughter, which results in the soldiers going on a mission to recover them. The romance of it wasn't terrible, but the main character suffered badly from too stupid to live syndrome. I must have read the first book in the series in December of last year or something because the next book listed is the second of the A Forbidden Love series by L.C.D. Salyer, which I read on Tumblr, a historical romance where a girl is forced into hiding as a maid when a man presumably murders her father in front of her. The lord of the house takes a special interest in her despite the fact that she would be ruined. When it's revealed that her father was actually alive, only badly wounded, she returns home only to discover that her mother ran away from a position as a princess in France. Lisa with the theoretically at rank make the note if only the king would approve of the union. I remarked in my review that this book was completely unnecessary and it seems as though even the author was bored with her work. I remember reading the actual book but I can't recall any of the details. Which Ways by Christy Tate. I thought that it was an interesting take on the Sabrina the Teenage Witch kind of stories where the girl has powers. Or does she? Her weird grandma shows up, but is she actually a witch? Who knows? I remember the murder aspect of it, but rereading my review reminds me of how her granny had all but pushed the main character Evie into a toxic boy together, only for Evie to rebel and finally put her foot down. Despite him being the central love interest, she eventually matured enough to see through his nonsense and say no. Also, I need to take a time out and say that somebody left a bad review on which ways claiming that the magic aspect wasn't realistic. I'm going to say that again so that it really sinks in. The magic in this book wasn't realistic. If you ever get a bad review, remember that there's people out there who are upset that a book about a girl finding out that she's a fictional creature isn't realistic enough for them. Up next is the Hades and Persephone series by Scarlett St. Clair. I read this book on YouTube and that will be linked if you want a more in-depth review of it. Overall, I found the characters of Hades and Persephone to be insanely lackluster. Persephone's personality changed depending on if the author needed a bedroom bunny or somebody who suffers from PTSD with literally nothing in between, which was enough to give me emotional whiplash. Hades' sole role existed to be a bedroom toy for Persephone. Her powers were a joke and the way that the third book ended was so laughable and dumb will not be reading the fourth and possibly last book if when it comes out. 
I finished up the Ghost series by Jonathan Muller. Despite me having enjoyed the first couple of books in the series, by the time that I reached the 13th book, I was so done with everything. If I had to read one more high fantasy name, I'm probably going to scream. Plus, the plot started to drag on too much, and I was relieved to finish the series. Overall, I still like this series and view the entire thing as a positive. I am interested in reading more from the author, assuming, of course, it's not some 50-book series. And then I read A Debt Repaid by Anne Isabel Blanco. In it, the main character, Arya, and her husband are blackmailed by Chase into him going on a date with Arya. He also claims to have proof of Arya's husband being in faithful torture. Chase constantly disrespected Arya's boundaries, and when she told him no one sexually assaulted her on multiple occasions. When they did do the do, Arya was filled with so much regret and self-loathing that she literally vomited. There was supposed to have been a second installment of this wonderful story, but it was never published. If you ask me that's probably for the best. It was at this point that I decided writing this up and came back later. Goodreads asked me if I'd read a bunch of books this year, of which the answer was yes. So it kind of threw off the order of everything else, so thanks a lot for that. However, some of them were parts of series, so I'll get to them later. The first newly added book is The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. In a move only ever seen in fanfics, the main character Olive begs to be saved from an awkward situation and ends up big dating a professor in her doctorate program, Adam. Like many people, I was drawn to the book simply because it looks like Ray Cullen Wren. And I'm not completely unconvinced that this wasn't originally Ray Lowe fanfic that got pulled to publish. This was a five-star read for me, if only because it was fun, the romance was sweet, and the book ended with a desperation for more. Then I read The Kiss Quotient by Helen Hoang. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I I don't know why I thought this, but since the art style was kind of similar to the love hypothesis, I was kind of hoping for more of the same. Instead, I ended up with a lackluster reverse pretty woman trope. To make matters worse, it kind of felt like the author had a creepy fetish for a woman with autism, and it made me hella uncomfortable. Up next is the Atlantis Grail series by Vera Narizan. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right either. Although I rated all four books two stars each, I'm not sure that the subpar rating properly conveys my feelings for the series. It's my standard case of, I really like this but in it, aliens come to Earth to warn the humans of their approaching doom via a giant and movable asteroid. The main character, Gwen, undergoes intense alien training in order to qualify for being rescued from the doomed Earth. As the story progresses, Gwen develops a strong relationship with the leader of the Save the Humans movement, as well as the Crown Prince of the Aliens. Together, the two of them uncover who is really behind the asteroid being flung towards Earth, trying to stop it, and maybe save the day in the process. In the end, although I did enjoy this series enough to seek out all four books, I think that the author author's main problem is bloat. The fourth and final book is over a thousand pages long. Also, keeping in mind that the book series is classified as young adult, ignoring for a second that in the last book, Gwen gets married and does stuff that goes along with that. Not only would the series have benefited from having been broken up into more than four books, it had also kind of needed somebody to tell the author, we don't need a 15 chapter subplot about the princess's lost cat. It also suffered from the same plot syndrome, in which is that the author had exactly one idea of the Hunger Games like competition aspect and she beat it over and over and over and over to, to the point where I'm skimming large chunks of text in the effort to simply get back to the plot. I am not worried about the main character in a first person book dying in book one of four things. This year I also wrapped up reading the Shatter Me series by Tahare Mafi. I did the first video on YouTube, finished the other five books on Patreon, and then put up a really long video summing up the rest of the series. The too long didn't read version of that 30 minute video is basically, please stop trying to romanticize a Nazi, thanks. I'll link that below. Up next is The Truth and Lies Saga by Jeannie McDonald. In it, a young woman, Mackenzie, finds herself falling for her best friend's current boyfriend. The two of them start messing around despite Drew not having broken up with Olivia. Right as Drew promises to finally put his foot down about Olivia's possessive behavior, Olivia says that she's pregnant with Drew's baby. In the end, the truth comes out. Olivia hated everything about Mackenzie and was doing everything in her power to keep Mackenzie unhappy and basically a servant to her. And the baby wasn't even Drew's, but Mackenzie's ex-boyfriend's baby. I don't have a whole lot else to say about the series other than that the second book could have been summed up with a single chapter. It was completely pointless and added nothing to the plot that the readers didn't already know. As it was, the third book probably could have been crammed into a few chapters as well. There was simply no point to any of it.
And then another YouTube read of the Breach series by K.I. Lin. In it, Delilah learns how to love herself after having been emotionally and physically abused by her father and stepbrother. Nathan learns how to love after his wife and unborn child were murdered by the mafia, which on the surface sounds great, but the problem is that the first book ended with the literal rape scene that was never addressed. And in the start of the second book, literally all of Nathan's family showed up to Delilah's hospital bed to shame her into getting back together with the man who'd raped her. Although in the middle book, there was an insanely half-hearted attempt with some couples counseling. It was obvious in the end that the author got bored with her own story and quickly went back to shoving Delilah and Nathan into bed together. The fourth book in the series was simply the first book from Nate's point of view and it made the entire thing worse because you already know how things are going to turn out and why he was like that. And then what has got to be the book with the worst ending ever, A Four-Letter Word by Michelle Lee. I'm going to cut out the nonsense and tell you straight up that 90% of the book was his trust and hallucination. So yeah, I about chucked my computer at the window with that one. Negative 7 billion stars out of 5. Cursor by Phoebe Lane. It took me a minute to remember having read this, especially because I didn't read a review. But anyway, Ashlyn is broken and will not stop running away from her past. She's also being hounded by her ex-fiancé, but it takes most of the novel to get to the fact that her fiancé intentionally drove into wrong-way traffic to end his life. Although I saw it coming from a mile away, the revolution of her running away from her dead fiancé and people hounding her to simply get over it only made the book that much worse. The Fairy series by Elizabeth Miles, another YouTube raid, and it will be linked below. A mediocre supernatural young adult series that revolves around a young girl, Emily, trying to uncover why three fairies have suddenly moved into town and why it is that they're murdering everybody whom they believe has sinned. Yet another example of cool idea of poor execution because I'm positive that the author had no idea of what she was doing. There was never any reason for the fairies to go around and murder people. And while it was a good idea to show Emily turning into a fury herself, the author never went far enough. In the end, this was a forgettable series that was dragged down with underage drinking, sex, and characters who were fatally punished for youthful mistakes. All Grown Up by Sadie Gruber. This is yet another example of good idea, if the author knew how to write. We follow Chloe and Leo from the time that Chloe is 14 years old and moves next door to Leo and his family, and the book ends when they're, I think that they're in their 30s, which I know it can be done right, but this book ain't it. So much time was spent on dumb, random things that didn't matter. Despite the two of them being endgame, the book spent too long on their side relationships before Chloe and Leo came back together, including multiple graphic sex scenes with the other people that they both ended up marrying. Chloe was also not a winner because after finding out that her husband cheated on her, she ran out and crept into the bed of Leo. And after getting knocked up by Leo, she hid the existence of his son from Leo for two years. Up next is Can't Tie Me Down by Jen and Elizabeth Henderson, the main character of Maya... Mayeri, whatever, worked as a fake girlfriend for Geeky Guys Online, but one day her account is hacked and sends all of her clients out to her remote Scottish town in droves and Star Trek costumes. This book was labeled as a rom-com, but it was neither romantic nor funny and only reminded me of an episode of Law & Order SVU. That, none of the men respected Mayeri's boundaries and one of them literally kidnapped her at one point. Even the actual love interest had no respect for Mayeri's boundaries and was using the entire incident as a cheap excuse to pressure her into marrying him. Everything worked out in the end, but it was a tedious chore to get through, and I remember skimming through a lot of the last several chapters simply so that I could have closure. Vivid by Ashley Busamonte, yet another YouTube read, a mediocre young adult magic trilogy in a world where magic is fueled by the primary colors. The overall plot dragged my opinion of it down. For sure, it's a story written with young girls who have never read a book in their lives in mind. The villain was paper thin with paper thin motivations that I saw through right away. The main character of Ava was whiny, bratty, immature, and was poorly written. She was supposed to be on the brink of adulthood and ready to graduate, but she was taking classes better suited for intro to your powers. Am I going to read the rest of the series when it comes out? Yes. Does Ashley still hate me? Undetermined, but if she's... But she signed my copy when I saw her a few months ago, and she didn't say anything about the videos. 
The Sound of Silence by Anne Wood. This is yet another pull to publish Twilight fanfic, and although the summary claims that it's out of print, I think we all know that if it exists on the internet, then it's forever. Although a certain yo ho yo ho source went down thanks to donkey holes. In the book, a young mute boy Alex moves to a new town because of bullying at his old school. He makes a fast friend with his school guide, Wes, but the two of them go from friends to getting each other off in Wes's car between classes in less than a day. I like the idea of the disabled character, and this book did have a lot of positive stuff about sign language, but the, but the nice things I have to say about this sorry excuse for a book pretty much ends there. Beautifully Broken Pieces by Catherine Cowles. After her mother dies, Taylor makes a split-second decision to move to a small town while she's on holiday there. She moves to a local family's guest house where she catches the eye of their eldest son and town sheriff. Now, this book had two parts, the romance and the murder mystery. I'll give you two guesses which part was better and which part had me feeling icky. Hint, it's not the murderer running around. I said in my review in good reason, not one single person was acting in Taylor's best interest. Her friends were upset when she said that she wanted to move to the town, but not one of them said, This isn't normal. I'm booking you an appointment with a grief counselor. Walker, the main love interest, said that he had to break down Taylor's walls, but he was only doing it because he wanted to get into bed with her and not because it would be emotionally healthy for her. Zero interest in reading the rest of the series. And the fact that the main character of the second book has the same name as my dog has nothing to do with it. The first two books in the Crave series by Tracy Wolf. Y'all know why I started reading this. In fact, I had multiple people send me screenshots of ads that popped up for them. Y'all, I got those ads too. Of course I had to read it. Granted, although I went embracing myself for a terrible dumpster fire of a cheap pilot knockoff, I kind of don't hate the first two books. In it, Grace moves to Alaska to be with her uncle and cousin after her parents die. She has to attend the boarding school that her uncle runs. Once there, she uncovers the horrifying truth that vampires, witches, werewolves, and dragons exist. A vampire tries to murder her in an effort to bring her dead boyfriend back, but the spell backfires and his spirit ends up being trapped instead of Grace's head. Oh yeah, the vampire is also the brother of her boyfriend, and to make matters worse, Grace fell hard and fast for Hudson after her relationship with Jackson soured. As I mentioned, I've only read the first two books, and although they're not amazing, my expectations were already rock bottom, so that helped. Looking forward to finishing the series because at least it's mildly amusing. When You Make It Home by Claire Ashby after realizing that her fiancé was using business trips to cheat on her, Meg runs off to the bed of an ex-boyfriend. This one nice hand results in a pregnancy that Meg struggles to hide. She also becomes involved with her best friend's husband's brother, who has recently returned from the Middle East without a leg. Yes, that's right. Meg has three romantic interests in this book, and each one is somehow worse than the last. Theo is constantly leaving, certain that he no longer deserves love. In the end, they kind of agree to get married without ever once having grown from anything that happened over the course of the book. These Violent Delights series by Chloe Gong. Look, I'm okay with Romeo and Juliet set in China on the brink of communism. I'm okay with gang wars and violence. Hell, I'm even okay with monsters. But what I'm not okay with was the cluster fork of nonsensical bullshit that was literally never once explained in this. Probably about 90% of these two books could have been cut out and literally nothing would have changed. These books were a complete chore to get through and I'm glad that they're behind me now. The Alienated series by Melissa Landers, yet another YouTube read because I was in the mood to snark a sci-fi novel for once. In it, after aliens make contact with humanity, they hope to strengthen the alliance between humans and aliens by doing a school exchange program. But casual racism threatens to destroy everything. Only the most lackluster romance imaginable can possibly hope to bring the two species together. I did a full video about it and that'll be linked below. It was around this time that I started in on a multi-book idea for a new YouTube series. I have yet to actually finish it, but the first book in the project was Bear to You by Sylvia Day. In the book, a billionaire thinks that he's God's gift to women and harasses a woman into sleeping with him. Their relationship was toxic as anything, and I don't know why there are four books past the first one. I will not be reading the rest of the series. Thank you. The first two books in the Iron Fairy series by Julie Kagawa. A rather mediocre mixed high-low fantasy series where a girl finds out that she's the daughter of a fairy king and goes on various cliche magical adventures. The first book was rather bland and seemed to hit every other fairy adventure novel trope, but, but the second gave way to more promise. Although I do enjoy the concept of the titular Aryan Fae, I'm not expecting much with the rest of the series, but we'll see.
yet another book for that mystery YouTube series that I really need to finish on Dublin Street by Samantha Young, in that a billionaire sexually harasses a young woman into sleeping with him. But this one is set in the UK. It's totally different, you guys. Sarcasm. This one was kind of an outlier in that mystery YouTube series project by Memories of a Geisha by Arthur Golden, which this one was a reread, but I had literally forgotten it existed until it popped up on this list of billionaire romances. And yikes, that's going to be a big fat no for me, dog. Take your pick. White guy author, weird racist undertones from said author, casual sexism, child grooming being the main theme of the book. This isn't romantic, it's creepy. Somebody call Olivia Benson, stat. Betrayed by Kira Cass. Yes, that's right. I did eventually go back and finish the second half of the book. I started on, on YouTube like a year earlier. The fact that I remembered to check it at all should be considered a miracle in and of itself, honestly. Anyway, the entire thing was too long with so much time with the characters faffing about to the point where the actual plot came along and it felt like the author was all like, oh yeah, I should resolve some stuff, shouldn't I? And the ending, ugh. I'm not over that second worst ending ever, superstars, why? And finally, I wrapped up the year by reading the current 11 books in the Princess Diaries series by Meg Cabot. It started after Queen Elizabeth died and my friend said that she wanted to watch the Princess Diaries movies. I told her to read the books instead, although I'm not sure that she ever did, but I did. And I have so many thoughts about the entire thing that I'm going to make a video about that, which I may or may not have done by the time that I put this video up. We'll see. And yeah, that's my 2022 reads all summed up nicely. Overall, I don't think that I forgot about as many as I would have thought. Here's to many more reads, both good and bad, in 2023.